My name is Catherine Elizabeth Clay, and I'm reading from Cassius Marcellus Clay's The Life of Cassius Marcellus Clay, memoirs, writing, and speeches showing his conduct and overthrow of American slavery, the salvation of the reunion, the union, and the restoration of the autonomy of the states. You didn't know who Cassius Clay is. He's a descendant of mine, and I want to make thing you understand that when he starts talking about his grandparents, he's talking about two sets of grandparents that uh, were brother and sister. So uh, this is I want to explain some of the family violence as I go along that happened in my family because. Emma Clay from Kentucky. Somebody wrote, Catherine Bateman wrote a book about Kentucky Clays. Eleven generations, because, you know, boomers. I was born in Madison County, Kentucky, United States of America, October 19th, 18 and 10, on the uplands of Tates and Jacks Creek near Kentucky River. My mother, Sally Lewis Clay, was the daughter of Eliza and Thomas Lewis, descended from the Scottish and English ancestors. Douglas being a family name to this day. My grandparents had a large family of sons and daughters, five of fine minds and physique. One of my aunts married James Garrett, governor of Kentucky, and another John T. Johnson, a long-time member of Congress and the nephew of Richard M. Johnson, vice president of the United States. My great-grandfather, Edward Payne, was a contemporary of George Washington, and is honorably named by Mr. Weems in his life of the father of this country. My grandparents were born in Virginia and lived in Lodge Spring, about four miles northwest from Lexington, Kentucky, till their death. My father, Green Clay, was born in Potawatomi County, Virginia, August 14, 1757, and died on October 31st, 1826. My Uncle Edward Clay was an Episcopalian clergyman, and Uncle Matthew Clay was a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson, often a member of Congress, and his friend Matthew was a man of fine person and quite noted for his proudness. In the old times, when old-fashioned knockdown was deemed more honorable than the pistol and bowie knife. One of his daughters was distinguished for her beauty, but perished in the burned theater of Richmond, Virginia, which at the time created a national sensation. My grandfather was named Charles and his father Henry, and his father again Charles, who was with his two brothers, Henry and Thomas, came to America in the time of Queen Elizabeth with Sir Walter Raleigh and remained here, each having received 10,000 pounds from their father, Sir John Clay of Wales. So, says Porter Clay, the half-brother of Henry Clay in 1848, but I believe I have the only reliable record of the Clay family extant. It's written on blank leaves in the works of Samuel Johnson. London, 1713. The oldest ancestor recorded is Charles Clay. No birth date given. I'd like to know what that is. This is a picture of White Hall in Kentucky. This one's called Claremont. My next ancestor... Henry Clay, oldest son of Charles and Mary Mitchell, was born in 1672. The other descendant line is all regular down to my own birth. It's evident that Reverend Porter Clay speaks from tradition, at which time Henry Clay, the orator and statesman, enters this family tree is not known. His father was John Clay, and that is all I know about it. He's always called me Cousin Cash. Porter Clay says I descended from Charles, three of the brothers, of the three brothers. I guess the third one was John. 
And that's where I come from. My family were remarkably long-lived. Henry dying in his 89th year and my mother in her 90, 90th year. And he didn't die until he was like 99, almost 100. I take, Alex, I take but little interest in these an antecedents, but I cannot but be a little proud that I, through my mother and Douglas blood, can claim to be one of the same race as that Gordon, who is now the noblest figure of our time, in our times. I write in the house in which I was born. It is well. It is a well burned brick structure with heavy range, work of Kentucky marble and gray gray, gray limestone, and the Grecian style, having three porticos of imperfect Corinthian and Doric Doric columns. It was added to after 1861, but the old building, after the English manor, was preserved almost intact. Even at the, that day, though there were many homesteads, the original forests in near proximity to the mansion were almost unbroken by the axe. The tulip, walnut, ash, Kentucky coffee bean, beech, and other magnificent trees rose at place in 60 feet without a limb. So breaks my heart. With native vines carried up with their growth, perhaps centuries old, and they're gone. The service, ever undulating, was clothed in ravines with native cane 12 feet or more in height it seemingly impenetrable in an east india jungle but most of the surface under the trees was bare and brown with fallen leaves the year round covered with exquisite wild flowers in summer and steady light and snows in winter the plume the black hull the may apple The pawpaw, the persimmon, the hickory, the walnut, hackberries, and wild grapes are found in profusion, which they are not to this day. The rivulets in almost every ravine were ever fresh and perennially from the vat reservoir of the forest hum humus, and fish were not were found in the very springs as they bubbled up in never ceasing music, whilst birds of every color and song, the chattering squirrel, the scream of the hawk, made all of nature's harmonious in its full development. So sad that Kentucky's not like this anymore. I don't ever remember seeing a hawk. Not there. Our family is the first of the human race, so as far we know, that ever claimed fee simple in this soil as my father was the first white man that ever, by preoccupation and culture and civic title, claimed ownership, the natives never having assumed propriety rights in the dark and bloody ground, for which was the common hunting place of all the tribes, is now the surrounding states. It is curious how far back the memory will reach, and I remember, as yesterday, the brilliant buttons and plumes of the Kentucky Volunteers, who my father led as Commander-in-Chief to the reliefs of Fort Meigs in Ohio in 1813, then besieged by the British under the Proctor and the Indians under Tecumala. General William Henry Harrison was the, was the federal commander of all the regular forces in the volunteer militia. As my physical courage and training greatly aided in the higher moral courage which my political life demanded, I have concluded to give an account of all my personal encounters from boyhood. I am a believer in bloods, not in the sense of 
arist aristocratic or plebeian bloods bullshit. But in natural organization, so moral or physical traits are aggregated in families. The first hewn log cabin in the count county was built by my father, and when the fa family moved into the brick mansion, which was also the first of that class, the oven, the overseer, Covington, dwelt in that old house in the border of the yard. It was with Covington's son that I had the first fight. I don't remember the cause of the quarrel, but I mastered him and gave him a terrible s scratchy face. His mother complained to mine, and when I came to the house, she followed Solomon's advice and ready a peach tree rod, and I bear testimony that she did not spare it. Now, when my dad used to bust my ass when I was growing up, he used to say, at least I didn't make you go out and pick your own switch. Um, when I was a child, my grandfather told me about the time he met Cassius Clay, and he was he was born eighteen eighteen ninety nine, and Cassius Clay in nineteen died in nineteen o two, and he met him as as an infant, and he said he was meaner than a snake, and I do not doubt that one help, hateful minute. At another time. Tis said, I told a story. Now this is where the family violence really sets in. As the lie is thus often charitable cloth and velvet vestments, she ordered me to sternly come unto her, but as I had once teetered in her metal, I was more inclined to take as gobbo into my heels, and I ran. She was not a woman to be trifled with and was not one of those sentimental creatures who sit all day with a recalcitrant, toddling thing, lecturing it upon the reasons why it should obey the mother and not the mother obey the child. Now, if there's one thing that's changed, this mother obeys her child. So she made chase and all those house servants and all the kitchen servants joined in the pursuit. Finding that I would be overtaken, I concluded to fight. There was a pile of stone siftings left over from an outbuilding of considerable size upon which I took my stand and made things lively. Throwing never in sham, find no blank cartridges, hitting hard. For as I had been whipped for fighting, now I fought not to be whipped. So the dear old mother had to come to herself. Thank God I never in childhood even raised my hand or turned my head, heart against her. So I surrendered. This was my second whipping and the last, for which I found escape neither in running nor in fighting. I even submitted with sublime philosophy to the inevitable. My mother was a Calvinist in faith, and though not believing in good works as the ground of salvation, yet was the most Christian-like and pious of women in every word and thought. With her, truth was the basis of all moral character. Now, if there's one thing that has not changed in any Clay family... It's the fucking truth. Because if you lie, you got your ass beat. You ever said anything. The, my dad busted my ass when I busted him. When I turned him into CPS for leaving my sister and me alone. While my brother was in middle school. And I was eight years old taking care of a six year old after school. And I got my ass beat for lying. He also made me write. I am a lair, I am a pig, and I will clean up after myself. A hundred times when I was eight years old, right after he got custody, I guess he thought that would make him a great parent and win over friends and family.
Let's see. With her, truth was the basis of all moral character. She would not tolerate even conventional lies, never saying, not at home, no to callers, but to the servants, beg them to excuse me. And what was she right? And was she not right? Let wisdom of all ages decide. This it was when I was asked in order to corner me if slavery was not a good and Christian institution, considering all the consequences, remembering her who had given me life to principles to live or to die by, that led me to answer no. My father was a stern man, absorbed in affairs. He spent little but time with the children and did not assume control. Yet he directed, which is a difference between my father, because he very much wanted control. Being a major dad, a drill sergeant in the army, raising three children. My father was a stern man, absorbed in affairs. He spent but little time with the children and did not assume control. Yet, he directed in the main what was to be done. And when the time had come, he sent me to school with my next oldest brother, Brutus J. Clay. Much to the regret, it it seemed to me, of my mother, for I was the Benjamin of the family. I don't know what that means. Through the forest, then, over the rivulets, flushing the birds, cropping the wildflowers, gathering the may apples, with the book satchel slung over my shoulders, and the lunch basket carried by turns with my brother, I set out. At length, in no less than a mile, we came to the common school, a log cabin unchinked under a beech forest near the spring and rivulets, which meet near by the foreman of Tate's Creek. The stones of the chimney yet lie there, half covered with bluegrass, but the trees are gone. But chimneys were of little use, as it was mostly in summer that the children from families far apart went to school. I well remember the great pleasure with which in childhood I took off the hated shoes and socks, and waded barefooted in the rain puddles and rivulets. The large scholars were held to their books, but laying mine down on one of those rude benches, I went into the water, running over the brightest bright pebbles, and amused myself catching the small minnows, which to this season swarmed upon the clear swallows, shallows. So I was to employ day after day, and the good mother again and again filled the lunch basket with nice things and topped them off with the ABC mystery. The neighboring girls were also in primitive stockings and were not averse to wading across the cool waters of playtime and hunting and digging the wild turkey peas and ginseng. In the near association, I had fallen in love. Platonic, of course. There was nearly a grown girl named C.B. and another named R.C.S. Now, when the dom, dommy saw the bad example I was setting, he desert, determined to reduce me to submission. So when I set out, as usual, for the branch, and I not obeying, he followed me and did all the school but taken in the situation, the teacher was the only one who had on shoes. I took position in the deepest pool where he could not reach me with his long beached rod. And as the girls happened to be the largest, he ordered Miss C. S. to bring me out. But as she advanced, I seized a stone and struck her with full, great violence, nearly severing her big toe from the foot. In this confusion, I was forgotten, and C.B. coming to me begged me to come out, for which I did 
at once did, and without ceremony set out for home. Now, was I not in love? Some structures are like wooden log. You can't get a responsive sound with a hammer. Whilst others are finely strung, like the famous Kronosia, that the slightest wave of air will wake them into melody. Yes, I was in love. This broke up the school business, and my mother, being told of the tragedy, was about to flog me once more, but my father soon commanded, and I was dismissed with a suppressed smile to my usual quarters. Such was my early life, as it leaves the question yet undecided. Are the tendencies of our life from nature or from education? Or rather, are they not from both? At all events, the mother, being both parent and teacher, mostly forms of the character. But I leave this with an open question about to, for others to decide, as many will, no doubt, with M.C.J. of Lexington, Kentucky, hold that God Almighty make the noble and ignoble at the same day. But this was sure, the first class was made out of the fine clay which the second was made of the gravel and refused which remained. So far as memory goes, the most of my youth seems but a dark night, with here and there a light set, so there remains but few events. I saw but little of my father. He was nearly always absent, and when at home was engaged in business. He was a land surveyor, which is why we own so much property. But on one incident reminds me how much those who rule children should remember that example is more potent than precedent. My father had an old Virginia military wine chest holding about half a dozen cups of, or glasses and as many bottles of liqueurs, mostly of domestic case, make, domestic make. These bottles were English square and very thin glass and very finely inlaid with gold leaf. To prevent the breakage by awkward servants, he would not allow anyone but himself to touch them. But in the morning, having a bottle of native bourbon, he filled with chamomile flowers, which began bitter, were used very generally as a tonic before breakfast. He would take out the bottle, fill his mouth with the hateful liquor, and having swallowed it, make a rueful, rueful face at the boys, but he would drink no more that day. He never would allow us to use cards or taste liquor. I watched him long time, not having it clear to my mind that if he was a good was good for Papa, it was good, no good for us. It was not good for us. At length, one morning, when he had made his usual libation and discharged a painful duty with heroism, as shown by his countenance of silent sufferance, <clears throat> I thought to myself, Now, if it is so bitter, why do you take it? So I'll see. And taking up the bottle and pouring out a portion, I found it far from bitter. Though, fortunately for me, the bourbon itself was not fascinating, but the bitter was all gone, and the chamomile was all but a sham. Having gone to four common voluntary schools as before described, and then to the Richmond Academy, our father sent Brutus and myself to the home of Joshua Fry, a celebrated teacher who having made a fortune still by the force of habit living on a fine farm in the banks of the Dix River in Garrett County, Kentucky taught a few scholars and his grandchildren for, who, for his amusement whilst there amongst others who reached distinction in the world of the congressman W.J. Graves who ki killed Silly in the celebrated duel before the champions of the North and South Mr. Fry was a teacher of Latin as speciality. Among the scholars was a very beautiful girl about the, my own age, L.F., 
and as in the first joint education of the sexes there was war, so now by the occurrence of contrast that was at peace, that there was peace. She inspired me to rivalry and study, and I soon surpassed her, and she mastered the Latin language as I never did any other language. And although my afterlife never allowed me much leisure for its use, I am a good Latinist to this day, never having studied English grammar at all at any time, I think I would have hardly be classified in the, that respect with Burns scholars in regards to my own tongue. What's a the learning of schools, ETC, yet my readers will judge. In the meantime, my father being the largest slave owner in the state, I early began to study the system or rather began to feel its wrongs. Whilst I was yet a boy, my sister Eliza, being very fond of flowers and their culture, I had my miniature garden also, with great delight, living close to nature and feeling that serenity and passive happiness which she always lavishes upon those who love her. One day, whilst absorbed in my favorite pastime, I heard a scream, and looking up, what I saw in my horror was to see Mary coming into the yard with a butcher's knife, and her clothes all bloody. All the servants from every cabin, big and long, ran wildly in tears, 